Let's have a word of prayer. Jesus, we ask you now to come and speak to our hearts today, to draw us closer to you as the song we just sang. Uh, ask if we were there. Well, this morning we will be there. And so I ask for you to speak to us and help us leave here, draw closer to you, and ready for your coming. Amen. A young couple were getting married, and the um, young man had a struggle, and he was talking to his dad about it. He says, Dad, my feet smell terrible. And I'm really conscious about that because, you know, I don't want my wife to, you know, get involved in that, and I, I don't know what to do. He says, well, this is what you do. You wash your feet every day real well, and then every night when you sleep, you wear socks. So he started doing that. Uh, but on the other hand, too, his wife-to-be, she had an issue. She was talking to her mother about it. She says, Mom, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I have the worst breath in the world. Worst breath. What can I do about it? And she says, well, when you get up, don't talk to anybody. Go immediately to the bathroom. Wash your mouth out and stuff. That should do the trick. So they both followed the advice that was given to them. And for about two or three or four months, everything was fine. But one early morning, the husband uh, kind of got awakened and realized that one sock was missing. So he starts looking all through the bed, looking for the sock. And of course, that wakes his wife and disturbs her. And she, without thinking, turns around and says, what's going on here? And she says, oh no, you ate my sock. <laughs> now the point of the story is is that both of them had a secret okay we have secrets we have things that are have gone on or going on in our life <laughs> things that we are concerned about that we wouldn't want to have on the 6 o'clock news with pictures at 11 and uh, we kind of want, want it hidden but with God, we don't have to have them hidden. In fact, they're not hidden. God knows everything, every, anyhow. In fact, he says in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 14, all deeds will be brought into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether good or bad. So we can't hide anything from God. So he has a plan for us. He says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So whatever this hidden burden situation you have going on, he says, come to me. He says in 1 John 1, 9, confess. Come and confess, and I will cleanse you. And he says in uh, 1 John 2, 1, if you do sin, if you do have some issues, you have an advocate. You have somebody who will stand up for you and take care of you. This morning's theme is on communion. And there's two actions going on this morning in communion. A washing and a delivering. That's why the title of the sermon is Washing and Delivering. One prepares the other. And they both point towards the cross where our sins were taken and where the, Jesus says they are taken and run away with, sent to the bottom of the sea, not remembered anymore. So this morning, what I want us to think of as we're going into communion is we can experience a spiritual washing and deliverance by partaking literally and spiritually in foot washing and communion. I'm going to say that again, but it seems kind of long. We can experience a spiritual washing and deliverance by partaking literally and spiritually of the foot washing and communion. First thing we're going to talk about is washing, the foot washing. And as was read today, it's John 13. You know the story very well. Disciples and Jesus were all gathered for the uh, Last Supper, for the Passover Supper. Uh, nobody had arranged to get somebody to come and take care of the feet, and it wasn't going to be some high government official. And Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, takes and moves clothes off and wraps the towel around and has the basin of water and gets down and starts washing their feet. When he gets to Peter, he says, I'm not going to have you wash my feet. You can't do that. And he says, that verse that was just read a few moments ago that said, unless I wash you, 
you have no part with me. Now when you read that, there's four pronouns there. Two of them are the same. I, you, you, and me. Now in Jesus' day, the feet got pretty dirty. You know, my, I, I wear sandals most of the time, except on Sabbath, and even sometimes at church I will wear them. Especially when you're in Hawaii, you can do that. And, um, but they, got, they get pretty dirty, so it would be very pleasant when somebody comes and takes some nice, refreshing water and massages your feet and washes your feet and gets them all nice and clean. Because you can imagine what feet look like in those days of Jesus' day, where you're walking all over the place, walking through who knows what that you've walked through, gets on your feet, might not have always taken a shower every day or a bath. So it was a pretty stinking job and a pretty humbling job for the person who gets down on their knees in front of you and washes your feet. But Jesus did this action to establish a change and to prepare a heart. To cleanse and to create a right attitude. To cleanse and deliver from a wrong attitude. And this morning, he might want to do the same for us. In a sense, Jesus was, when he knelt before the disciples and was doing this, was doing John 3.16. Because when you read John 3.16, as many of you all know, it talks about four ways Jesus gives. He gave his love, gave his son, gave his universal invitation, and promises eternal life. And he's a giving God. And so as he's kneeling before each of the disciples, he's giving. He's serving. He's serving because in a few moments, he would be serving the Last Supper. And in a few hours, he would be serving his, himself for all of us. Isn't that good news? So two choices, as we see in this story. I, back to 13.8, I, you, you with me. Or, I, not do, and he says, you have no part with me. That's a pretty scary situation because in a sense, that's what sin is. Isaiah 59, 2 says, our iniquities or sin separates us from God. So when Peter is saying, I don't want to do this, he says, no part, in a sense, you're going to be separated. Now, being eternally separated is not something we want to have done, correct? In foot washing, there's no requirement needed. Just receive it. You don't have to do anything. You have, don't have to get down and do any scrubbing yourself. You're not washing your own feet. Somebody else is. In this case, it was Jesus. This is a good example of grace. Because for grace is a gift given. We can't earn it, as Ephesians 2 says. Now, would it change an attitude? It apparently changed Peter's because when Jesus said what he said, Peter said, well, don't just wash my feet. <laughs> get me from head to toe. Um, I was not raised a Seventh-day Adventist when I became one. Uh, it didn't necessarily have my dad doing double backflips. And we sometimes had issues about it. Well, one day, he and my mom came to church and we were living in Hanford. And that Sabbath, we were having communion. So as the, the short sermonette was done and then the pastor mentioned everybody's going to go to their appropriate place for foot washing, my dad goes, What? And so I said, well, follow me. So we were going upstairs, and I'm trying to explain it to him. And I can see my dad, another dumb, crazy thing Adventists do. Got the day wrong, eat funny meat, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I could just see it, and he was like, why? So he gets up, and he, he gets, and he sits down. And he says, now I'm going to go get some water and a towel, and then I'll come back. And once you take your shoes off, I'm going to wash your feet. And then I'll go get new, more fresh water and towel and come back and I'll take my shoes off and you can wash my feet. And so as I'm doing this, I can see my dad looking around and this is where you know, all the men of the church are up there. And this is in Hanford, a farming community. So he's looking around. My dad was an, a welder, so he was a kind of an, a hands-on, outdoorsy type guy. And he's looking at these men getting down, washing one another's feet, some of them pray, praying with one another. A couple of guys might have even shown a little emotion. And he sees these manly men with calloused hands washing each other's feet. And it got to him. And I don't know completely what was going on, but I think as he saw his son kneeling down in front of him washing his feet, that got to him. You know, it was kind of an honor. 
I mean, I did a lot of things for my dad, but that's a pretty humbling situation to wash his feet. And then vice versa, when he was washing mine, he did a lot of things for me, obviously, raised me, but I don't think he ever did anything like that. So when we were done, you know, we had prayer and we sang. My dad says, this is a good thing. He says, I wonder why more churches don't do this. So the foot washing prepares us for the deliverance. The deliverance I want to talk about this morning briefly is from the book of Exodus chapter 12. For in the book of Exodus chapter 12 is the first Passover. And I'll go through, and you, if you want to turn there, you can, but I'll go through some of the highlights of it. This was the 10th plague that was going to be coming. The final plague before full, complete deliverance. And so several requirements were mentioned. Get a perfect lamb. And if need be, share it with somebody who doesn't have one. Kill it at twilight. Eat a certain part of it a certain way. Take the blood, leftover blood, and put it around the door like that, the door frame. When you're, while you're eating this meal, eat it clothed and ready to go. Shoes on, coat on, got your running shoes on, backpack, ready to go, ready to travel. Um, And that night, stay in the house because an angel will pass over and any firstborn who are in a house that does not have the blood, not covered by the blood, will die. So in a sense, the Passover started in Exodus pointed forwards to the cross. And this morning, we, being involved in communion, point backwards to the cross. So both of them end up at the cross because of what Jesus did for us. The lamb at the Passover points to the cross as he became the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and was the final sacrifice. And the bread which we take, the small wafer, symbolize Jesus' body points again backwards to the cross where Jesus gave his body for you and I. His body was given at the cross, a vehicle in which there could be, we would be cleansed and delivered spiritually. And the, ve the vehicle is the body. But as read on the second verse today, the cleansing agent is the blood. For he says in Hebrews 9.22, all are cleansed with blood, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So thus, as you take the juice this morning and drink it, symbolic of the blood, we're being forgiven. Um, let's see what I got to tell you. When you have that blood put around the door, I was thinking, what's the importance of a door? In most houses, practically all houses, the door is very important because the door is very private and very personal. You only have people coming in and out that door, people who you know. So by putting the blood over that, you're saying, Jesus, I want you in this house. The door is yours. And by staying in there, inside the blood-covered door, inside that house, you're acknowledging the angel who, as he goes and passes by and sees the blood, says, you're okay. You're covered. We're covered by what Jesus did for us. So today, as we get involved in the, in the cleansing and foot washing and being served with the bread and the juice, we're asked to take the bread and the juice and not just leave it right there. We're asked to take it and take it within. For you see, you can have the greatest meal on the table, but if you don't take it in, it doesn't do you any good, right? As we take the blood or the juice for the blood and the bread for the body in, we're taking it in and we're going to do some good. It just sits on the table. It doesn't do any good. And that's what we want to have Jesus do for us today. 
all these actions, I've used the idea of deliverance, and I want to talk about the final aspect of deliverance on this final story. I may have used this story before. If I have, don't you can just fall asleep for a minute. Well, there was a pastor who came in who was speaking in his church, and you know he had spoken in this church for a long time, well-known pastor and stuff. People were kind of used to him. This morning, he gets up in front of the people, and uh, he puts a bird cage on here. And people go, "What?" Kind of shook the decorum of the church. A bird cage? What's going on? He says, "I was walking down the street," he said the other day, and I saw a young boy who had some birds in this bird cage. And he said, I, I came up and I said, well, what are you going to do with them? And the young boy says, well, I'm going to take them home and I'm going to you know, play with them and I'm going to poke them and I'm going to pull their feathers and I'm going to uh, watch them get frightened. I'm going to even have the cat run around them. And the pastor said, oh, they don't belong to you. They do now. Well, you're going to get tired of doing this. Well, I get tired, then I'll give them to the cat. The pastor says, well, how much do you want for them? And the boy says, these old birds, they're not parrots or anything, cockatoo or something like that. They're all these old birds, just regular old birds. He says, how much? So the boy thought, hmm, $10. So the pastor took the birds and gave the boy $10. And then he walked out in the field a long way away, opened the door to the birdcage, and then stepped away and waited. And the birds kind of were over near the door of the birdcage and realized, this is not a trick. And took away. It took off. They were free. When he got through telling the story, he then said, I have another story for you. He says, uh, one day Jesus and Satan ran into each other on earth. And Satan, and in fact, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane, or the Garden of Eden. And Satan says, <laughs> just walked through the garden and got me some people. Got me some of those humans you think are so wonderful. I tempted them and baited them. They went right along my way. Fell for the trap. Well, what are you going to do? Well, he says, Satan says, I'm going to teach them how to hurt each other, how to abuse each other, divorce each other, kill each other, just make life miserable for each other. And Jesus says, well, they don't belong to you. They do now. I can do whatever I want with them. Well, then what are you going to, then, then when you're through with him, he says, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to kill him. So Jesus says, how much do you want? And Satan says, want? You don't want these people. They are nasty people. They'll spit on you. They'll hit you. They'll slap you. They'll kill you. You don't want them. And Jesus said, how much do you want? Your life. And that's what Jesus gave. He paid the price, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6.20. We are not our own. We were bought with a price. He paid the price on the cross that Friday. He actually paid the price, I guess you could say, when he washed each other, everybody's feet. But then he paid the price with his body and the blood to completely wash us. And then that Sunday morning, he came along and opened the cage door. The tomb was open. We were free. So this morning, as we take part in the foot washing and the communion, we will learn how to be free in Jesus and point to the fact that one day Jesus is going to come back very soon, we hope, to free us completely from this earth and get to the home he really is looking forward to us having.